Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about how the classical music record industry destroyed the value of classical music. <laughs> that is its own product. It was a miraculous achievement, believe you me. But in order to do it, we need to have a little bit of history. And we're going to have, I think, quite a bit of fun talking about this. I love this topic personally, not because I like to complain. I mean, I do like to complain, but, but, but because it's an actual historical and economic and sort of marketing moment that's very, very fascinating. It really is. And I don't have answers to the questions that are going to come up. I'm just going to try and describe what they did. Some of you know what they did, but I don't think anybody really has sort of the complete picture, at least in the way that hopefully uh, that I'm going to talk about it. And we're going to do it entirely in considering Toscanini recordings. I think that's really one of the great ways to look at it. Why? Because Toscanini was, for much of the 20th century, the iconic conductor, um, at least in the United States. Perhaps in Europe, there were people like Fort Wengler and those guys. But, you know, they were, they were even, even they weren't as well uh, admired and respected because they weren't as prolific. They didn't have as many recordings coming out. But as somebody who had the public's imagination as what a conductor should be, it was Toscanini. It was Toscanini for the first half of the 20th century and for quite a bit of time after that. So I have like, I have to get my, my props together here. So give me a second. Um, I should have had them ready before we started, but this will only take a moment because I'm usually pretty zippy with this stuff. Okay, now we're ready. What we need to understand first is the revolution that overtook the recording industry generally, not just the bit that did classical music, with the advent of the LP around 1950, the early 1950s. It was an earthquake. Nothing, uh, orders of magnitude more significant than, than things like the invention of the compact disc or the 8-track tape player. Remember those? Remember 8-track tapes? Holy cow. But no, it really was. And I'm going to tell you why. In simple, simple dollars and cents, I have a fabulous quotation here from Harvey Sachs, his, his latest fabulous, by the way, um, Toscanini biography, which you really should read if you care about this. There's a great book. It's wonderfully written and full of fabulously interesting information. But what he wrote was, in 1935, a five-disc set of 78 RPM discs about what you'd need to capture, say, a Beethoven or Brahms symphony cost $10. I mean, he didn't write this. this is, these are his statistics. Let me just tell you, I wrote this. Anyway, cost $10. In today's money, that's $179. Can you imagine that? $179. An LP in 1950, on the other hand, cost about $1.25 or $13 in today's money. Now, what that means is that, I mean, can you imagine what that, what, I mean, what does that mean? Let's just say what it means. What it means is that recordings had formerly been a true, genuine luxury. I mean, 179 bucks for one symphony. Only the wealthy could afford them and the equipment that went with them to listen to them. And it, it, it's sort of fascinating, isn't it? You know, you spend all that money to hear something in crappy sound, but that's what it was. I mean, before that, it was even harder. Before that, you got, you know, player organs installed in your mansion and worked on piano rolls and things like that. So, so yeah, it was still a deal in a way, but 179 bucks for one single symphony on 578s. By 1950, you were spending 13 bucks, which is what a full price CD cost when CDs came out in the 70s and 80s, basically 13 to $15. Remember, that was the price point. So the cost of recorded music has essentially remained the same or gone down. I mean, now with the advent of digital technologies and downloads and all that stuff, it's gone way down, way, way down. So just from a technological point of view, the cost has gone down. But, but more than that, what happened was that music became a mass consumer product that everybody could afford. 
And that was the problem classical music had in a nutshell, because classical music has always been a product for the elite. It's an elitist medium. There's no way around that. Do I think that's a good thing? No, I hate it. I wish everybody and their mother listened to classical music because I think it's marvelous and I think they'd love it, but it just is. The, the notion that this could become a, a mass medium, something that could be genuinely popular, has some, is something that the classical music industry has never dealt with. They've never figured out what to do about it because they have always felt and maybe correctly, I don't know, that if that in order to appeal to the mass market, they would be turning their backs on the surefire audience. That is, the snobs. And the snobs have money. And so they wanted to make sure that they continued to appeal to their little 3% or 4% or whatever it was back then of the market for recorded music because they were surefire customers. And that was how they, they computed their economics and their return on investment on never growing the market. I think that was the first huge opportunity that was missed because there are ways of selling the stuff without diminishing it. You don't have to belittle it. You don't have to cheapen it. You don't have to coarsen it. You, you know, you just don't have to be a snot about it. So, you know, somewhere between snot and vulgarity, there is a happy medium. And I happen to hope that and believe that's sort of where we all are, by the way, because we like what we like and we're proud of the fact that we like it. And some of it does take a certain level of culture or intellectual acumen that other kinds of music don't. There's no question about that. But on the other hand, you don't lord it over anybody else. You don't deny them the opportunity and you don't prevent them, actively prevent them from enjoying it. But be that as it may. When the compact disc came out, we're now jumping ahead because we're talking about price. And the price now from 1950 until today basically has not changed for physical product. Yeah, there was budget product that was six bucks or something that was 13, but you're, it, it's all cheap entertainment. It's all low budget entertainment. It's the price of a movie ticket. You know, whether it's $5 or $10 or $15, it's essentially in the grand scheme of things, the same thing because $5 to $15 is nothing compared to $179. And that's the point I'm making. It's all inexpensive in one way or another. So the compact disc came, comes out, right? And here's the opportunity to make fabulous sounding new digital recordings and re-release the entire analog catalog from the beginning and resell it to the same 4% or 3% all over again so they could have the stuff in the new medium and they'll all get rid of their LPs and whatnot. So what does that have to do with Toscanini? Well, RCA, as you may recall, released the complete RCA Toscanini recordings. And that was like a big deal. And when they released them, they released them in a, a first of all, as individual discs as part of its own series. And, you know, here, here they are. This is what they looked like. Let me just show you one of them. They had these pictures of Toscanini with these special black label RCA things. Because remember, they're like red seal. They're usually red. But these were black. Here it is. And that's what they looked like. And they were released independently, individually, disc by disc. But they also released them as a collection. Did you hear that? That squeak? Hear that? That is the point. When they release them as a collection, get ready, I'm gonna try and do this without causing a catastrophe. I cannot promise that the catastrophe isn't going to happen, but here we go. All right. Oh God, this is what they released. Okay, there's a third layer down here. You'll just take my word for it. Look at this. This is a piece of furniture. It's an actual piece of furniture, very solidly made. It has this beautiful glass case, which, let's see if I can do this. See, which opens like this, and it's like magnetic so that it stays closed. And although the disc didn't exactly fit, the demand, nothing ever fits in this industry, you know that. I'm going to put this back. That's what you got, and it costs, oh God, I don't know. 
I don't remember. It's 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 what eighty something CDs, all the Tuscan new stuff. It cost a couple hundred bucks. It cost a few hundred dollars. Of course, it came with the with the furniture. And that was some sort of indication, an indication on behalf of the label, that the product was still had some value. I mean, real value. You don't build a piece of furniture to house your product unless it has value. And it did. And there were other similar things. I don't know if you remember that when, when Hensler did the first complete Bach edition, they also had an even bigger bookcase than this guy. You could get the bookcase. You get it separately. You bought the edition on 300 and some odd CDs, and then and then you could buy the bookcase separately. Deutsche Grammophon, when it had its last complete Beethoven edition, also had it on CDs and boxes. They have it sitting right up over there. Um, they had this nice hardcover book, and it was in this lucite double layer shelf object thing. I mean, these were conversation pieces. They really, really were. It was the era of furniture releases. But, you know, the industry still believed that what it produced mattered and had, had real value. And so it needed to be packaged and sold as such. So let's go on ahead a few more years. So that's it. That was the furniture period. And quite, quite a period it was. And I remember getting my, my Tuscanini shelf and feeling, feeling that I had arrived as a classical music consumer because only the best and most sophisticated amongst us had the shelf. Other people had selections, they had bits, they had individual discs. But if you got the shelf, damn it, you were serious. And I was serious. So that was that. Then, of course, it came time to re-release the Tuscanini edition because, you know, you have anniversaries, you have things. I don't remember what every anniversary was, and I don't particularly care. But the complete RCA collection came up, and they couldn't just, I mean, you couldn't top the shelf. No way could you beat the shelf. They could remaster the whole thing and claim that it was all remastered. It wasn't all remastered, but some of it was. And they could add some things that were not in the shelf. So, for example, Tuscanini's BBC recordings, which they could license from EMI or something like that. So they did that. They did it. But how did it look and what did we get? What we got was this thing. Now, this thing, first of all, it always came with the top as you can see here, let me see, let me show you. I'm, I've taped it together because it was always bursting at the seams. These things, these things never held together. They were, they were, they, the cardboard joins were very cheaply done. So they always arrived broken or usually arrived broken, especially if you ordered them from Amazon or one of those dealers now because shops didn't exist. You know, when record shops existed, you could go and they would get an entire pallet of stuff and they would neatly stack it and take care of it. It would arrive intact. But when you order something from one of these, these mail order things, because there were no record stores around anymore, you know, they would throw it in a bag and throw it in the mail and it would get crushed by all the other crap on the back of the UPS truck or whatever service they used to destroy the products that they were distributing and you would get something that was invariably damaged in transit and I just gave up sending things back. I said, I don't care. If I can glue it together, I'm keeping it because it's just not worth the trouble. It's not worth the trouble. So we got this other Tuscanini edition. Now, that one cost several hundred dollars. This one was half that or less. It was much, much, much less expensive. The value had got, gone down considerably. Of course, what you got was had less value. It was not packaged, obviously, with the shelf. But more importantly, what was missing were all of the fabulous, fabulous scholarly notes written by the likes of, well, they were by Harvey Sachs, by, by um, Harris Goldsmith, and by Mortimer Frank. I mean, all these, these Tuscanini scholars and enthusiasts who wrote the most wonderful booklet notes for each release, and all of those were poof, gone. 
<laughs> totally gone. They just assumed you knew who Tuscany was and why he mattered, and that and that having a guide to the 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 specialness of the performances was no longer necessary. So what they did essentially was they reduced the possible the possible audience for this stuff, made it more difficult for them to acquire more if they wanted it, just threw it all in a box and said, okay, we're going to do it on the cheap. And they did it on the cheap. And because they did it on the cheap, the product looked cheap. I mean, its value, its value was diminished, completely diminished. I mean, yes, it was nice to have all this stuff in one place. The remastering was nicely done. I can't complain about what it is, but that was done by mostly the previous generation of RCA people. Now it was just a question of of trying to get the same people who bought the shelf to buy the box. Because I suspect that the market for people who bought the box was not a heck of a lot larger than the shelf people. I really, I really think the furniture guys probably got it, and like me, I wasn't gonna get rid of the piece of furniture just because the uh, the cheapy box showed up. But that wasn't the only cheapy box. You know it, and I know it. What happened? Well, then they started taking, taking the the thing apart, because you know these were limited editions. These boxes, the shelf was gone. The big box went out of print. They never reprinted it, even though there would have been demand. How many of you are still saying you want the Zell box, you want this box, you want the Reiner box, you want the Munch box? Because we talk about them and they're gone. They were special editions and they're gone. So what did they do? They started releasing cheapy boxes, super budget priced boxes. This was, These are two different series of them, several years apart. These are the Beethoven symphonies and other things. This is the Beethoven box. No, it's just the Beethoven symphonies. There's a Beethoven box, too, that has more Beethoven. And this is the Verdi, the Verdi thing, which has 12 CDs of all of his Verdi recordings. And these were dirt, dirt cheap, no notes whatsoever, nothing useful or interesting about the performers or the performances, just stuff for people who just wanted to get it. And so in a way, the, the move to streaming services and digital media is completely understandable and logical because they're giving you less and less and less and less. The only thing they could give you less than this is a digit, <laughs> is just the music completely disembodied because this is in close to this is as close to being completely disembodied as physical product as you could possibly get it. Um, so that, you know, the idea of a, a classical CD as a, a class product, a luxury product, even if the price isn't crazy, is something that matters, is something that had, had physical substance that reflected its, its cultural substance. Is, like I said, I'm not making judgments about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's both. I really do. I think, I think it's a good thing if you can sell it. It's a good thing in the sense that it gives some recognition of its value, its cultural value, which is very high. It's a bad thing in a sense that it, it, it does, does present the music as something off-putting to a lot of people. But then again, but then again, Pop music has done the same thing. There are deluxe editions of the Beatles. There are deluxe editions of Ella Fitzgerald and the Modern Jazz Quartet. There are deluxe editions of Pink Floyd. Heck, you know, any kind of classic rock, they get deluxe editions. And look at what, you know, deluxe editions of Star Wars, of film soundtracks, so they're incredibly expensive. Far more expensive on a per disc basis than classical music ever is because those deluxe editions are going to sell a few copies. So they figured they could make some money and they upped the price. So many, meanwhile, so they're, they're mining the Toscanini stuff for a quick buck and in the process making it as cheap as they possibly can. Then along came the Toscanini 150th anniversary edition. Now, 150th anniversary is a big deal in classical music because even though most classical music performers live to be older than 150, it's still a milestone. It really is a milestone. And, and you would think they would do something very, very nice for it. But the problem was they already had the shelf and they had the box, the big box. 
So for 150th anniversary of Tuscan India, they issued a little box, a little teeny, tiny, teensy, teensy boxy called, called the Essential Recordings. Well, that's a problem. Why are the Essential Recordings a problem? Because, first of all, you get, what, 20 discs, where before they had 80-something, and that's telling us that all of the other ones must be non-essential recordings. Well, where does that leave us? How are they going to sell the non-essential recordings when these are the essential recordings? And not only that, not only that, but having, having done the essential recordings, who, who, according to who are these the essential ones? I mean, some, some people pick these out. And, and uh, you know, by I think it was organized by Harvey Sachs. Yes, and he certainly knows. And Christopher Diamond, they, 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 they know. They're very, very knowledgeable. And they know their Toscanini, and they know their historical recordings. And so, you know, I'm sure they, they made a nice selection. I mean, I, they did. I can tell you it's a very nice selection. But I can think of 20 more recordings that I wish had been in here, but are not. And it's really a shame because they were told, remember, that not that, you know, if you had your way, is this how you would want Toscanini to be remembered? Of course not. They were told by the record label, listen, we don't have any money and we want to do something to try and sell this stuff again. So pick your top 20 and that's what we're going to do. And that was that. So they had no choice. It was called the essential recordings. I have a feeling that if you asked Harvey Sachs, if these are the only essential Toscanini recordings, he would say, what are you, out of your mind? But he did the job. He did, he did it as well as he could, given the circumstances. And so now what you have is a record label that is essentially writing off, in terms of Toscanini, 75% of its Toscanini catalog, because it's not essential. It's not essential anymore. And how do you think the people feel who bought the shelf? We should be outraged, we shelf owners. It's, it's terrible that they did that to us. Absolutely terrible. I, I, can you see where this is going? I don't think I need to belabor this point anymore. What has happened all by itself, this has nothing to do with with marketing and sales and it's people who have have given up they've given up on their own business and on their own product is it possible to sell more of this stuff to more people sure it is do i know how to do it no not particularly i mean maybe these videos will help do it i don't know i really don't know i, I can't pretend to have all the answers so i i have to be a little careful in in, in dumping all over these people. But, I, but I, what I can tell you is the way not to increase the market for classical music is to diminish the value of what you are trying to sell to the point where you can't even give it away anymore. That's, that's just sad. That's really, really sad. Now, I know, you and I know, not everybody is going to run out and buy 84 Toscanini CDs, even if they could, even if they weren't being given away. Who has time? Who's going to listen to all of them? Well, crazy people like me, I have time. But uh, over the years, over years, mind you, but with so much of the same stuff now, all the same stuff by other equally fine, let's face it, conductors and orchestras and in better sound, uh, you know, why, why choose Toscanini? How are you going to sell this stuff? All I can say is, I don't have the answer to that question. All I can say is, that's their job. It's their job to figure out how to sell this stuff. I don't have a lot of pity for people who get paid to do a job and then don't do it. And they simply decided somehow as a corporate strategy that they're not going to do it. That they don't care to do it. That they don't know how to do it. For whatever reason, they're just not going to do it. And so the result, as I said at the beginning of this chat, was that the value of the music, the music itself, forget the physical product or its presentation or, you know, the whole, the whole, you know, marketing packaging and whatever folder all that surrounds it. The value of the actual music today 
is zero. <laughs> it is effectively zero. And once that genie's out of the bottle, I don't see how you put it back. I truly, truly don't. Yes, I mean, they'll make some LPs. Maybe they can sell those at an exorbitant price. Some people may, you know, take these public domain performances and reissue them and diddle the sound and such. I mean, there's always going to be the same few people who are willing to buy the same thing all over again in the hopes that somehow it's going to sound better, different. I don't know. But I, I can tell you, they have basically, uh, not basically, they have, they have simply diminished the value of what they're trying to sell to nothing. And we will continue to buy it. I will continue to buy it. When it comes out, when the next Tuscanini edition comes roaring out, I, you know, there's stuff they could put in there. There's lots of unreleased Tuscanini. There are broadcast air checks. There's stuff that have stuff that's appeared on on all kinds of small pirate labels and private things and whatnot. There's a lot that they could do. There really is in the next Tuscanini edition, and I'll buy it. And so will the same twelve people, and maybe they'll do a limited edition and sell out, and then they'll forget about it again until the next time. And that's what they're stuck doing. And Boy, I just think that's so damn pathetic. Don't you? Shouldn't they go out and try and sell this to somebody else besides me? <laughs> yeah, it's their choice. So that's my take on how the record industry has diminished the value of what they sell to nothing, using Arturo Toscanini as the iconic example of that dreadful, dreadful practice. Keep on listening, folks. They know we will. I know we will. What else have we got to do? Take care. Bye-bye.